one. Hey. Oh, thanks for thanks for coming out. Obviously, horrible weather and train delays and everything. So really cool we made out on on this horrible Saturday. Uh, so hi, um, my name is Sam Gilby, and I hate making posters. Just wanted to get that confession out of the way. Uh, but I really love starting them. Like when you get the idea for something, it's like yes, this is going to be so awesome. And then you know when you finally finish it, it's like that's also a great feeling. But that's like sort of one percent either end, and it's the well, I've just got to count ninety-eight percent in the middle that's horrible. So it's the hard work in between that you know that's hard work. Obviously, you know, I'm being facetious. I love it really, but the fact is, sometimes I do wish I had a less detailed style because it can take something like the, my Jules poster probably took I don't know three to four weeks maybe. Although on and off with other projects on, so you know, um, th them's the breaks. But yeah, so. Going back through some of my work, I'm sure a lot of you've seen Loki, but I was thinking like, what happens is, as you look back on your career, obviously you're just going through it one project at a time, but looking back, you realize there's certain points that feel like you've gone on a different tangent, like um, you started a different timeline. It could be some agency that you've put into something, like you've done a piece that leads to another piece, or you know, you get contacted by someone new. So, but just to go back, go way back, when I was a like farm boy on Tatooine, with hopes of you know getting into out there into the big wide galaxy, um, like when I was a kid, this poster is like, well, it's probably still my favourite movie poster of all time. And you know, at this moment is when I sort of fell in love with the idea of just well, you know, a Star Wars, b kind of science fiction, but also collage posters in particular. You know, they get a bad rap, and obviously. They're still used a lot in a Photoshop style for marketing, right? You know, like let's have a the cloud of faces and all that stuff. But you know, I love the kind of to me this is still kind of magic, even though it forces you to look at it like you could say if you've not seen the movie, it's like so these guys must be really tiny because they're behind you know Luke Skywalker's leg, right? But you, you kind of because Darth Vader is much bigger, you sort of buy the magic of like this collage with all these different. These different things coming to work together. So you know, I, when I later on came to obviously I didn't know that that was by Thomas Chantrell till many years later, uh, and I love the work of Drew Struzan as well and lots of other artists. But this to me is like the one thing. So when I was a kid, you know, um, I just drew all the time, and I just draw my favourite things. So we would, you know, I think the first Star Wars film I saw at the cinema was actually Return of the Jedi. Um, but I would come home from the movies and I'd draw them and sometimes you'd have like some kind of leaflet that went with it and I'd have things that I could copy from that. So basically, you know, I've always like had enjoyed painting from reference and I just kind of stopped. I forgot to stop doing that. Um, like hopefully now when I do portraits, I don't have to say who the character's name is next to them so you can tell who it is. <laughs> but, you know, you got to start somewhere. Um, and like uh, drawing Transformers is fun. They're really good for like, um, you know, cause it's all boxy, learning about foreshortening. And, and I remember like, I, I really loved the comics that you could get. So I would probably, you know, just be copying those. And this is actually the first artwork I ever sold. So I, would, I drew this as a black and white thing. And then we photocopied them for my school, like Christmas fair or something. And like, this is the first, although, but all the money went to the school, so I didn't make a penny. So <laughs> it was many years later where I actually started to make a living from art. Um, but yeah, then like kind of late, a bit later on. So first of all, it's like toys and Star Wars. And then my uncle uh, had a load of like um, Spider-Man comics that were all mostly uh, drawn by John Romita, who to, to this day is kind of my favorite Spider-Man artist, even though you know, there's so many other great ones, um, going back to Kirby and everything. But Romita's just the, just the quality of the, you know, the, the line work and the poses. And there's a certain, accuracy uh, compared to say Kirby is more loose and expressive and this appealed to me for, for whatever reason and then later on discovered like 2000 AD and like so Simon Bisley and ABC Warriors just amazing detailed drawings that you know I just really loved so then like I was making my own comics um, kind of inspired by all that stuff what I remember used to doing I used to draw, draw them A3 with a load of different felt tips and like fine liners and stuff the coolest thing was when you took that and you've got all the, you know, the rubbish like felt tip smudges and everything. When you photocopy it and shrink it down to A4, it looked like it was a better drawing, basically. <laughs> so that was that was cool. And that was like the first thing seeing about, you know, seeing your work 
that once you go into printed form, it can be a bit different. You know, and just experimenting with inventing characters. Obviously, back then in the 80s, 90s, everything was about ninjas. So it's like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and American Ninja, all those movies and stuff. Um, so oh, I love all that stuff and playing with panels. Like now, I've never really done comics. Um, I used to want to. I don't really feel that way, partly because it's very hard to make a good living out of it. Like to the, the amount you get paid per page, I think is pretty low. And with a more detailed style like mine, I just don't think it would work. I'd love to do covers. Um, you know, that, that'd be something I still like to do. But the other thing back in the day was like video games. So video games used to look like that on the right. So then the, the cover art had to really do an important job, um, more so than a movie poster of getting you to, you know, want this game. So it's almost like in your head, you had to take what was on the cover and almost like imagine that when you were playing the game. But then the other cool thing, so Bob Wakelin, if you look him up, he did loads of amazing covers in, in like 80s, 90s, um, for like the Spectrum, Commodore 64 and stuff like that. But then someone would have to take that and like make the loading screen. <laughs> and that must have taken so long then when there wasn't, you know, any like Photoshop or whatever. Um, but I used to, you know, that aesthetic is still pretty cool and like fair play to whoever did that because it's not bad. Um, that's another one he did. So then um, I was always jealous of my friends who had Commodore 64s and Spectrums, like playing games. But then we eventually did get an Amiga and that had an amazing, like pre-Photoshop, had this software called Deluxe Paint, which was, you know, first time you could like paint and you'd have like, I think up to 256 colors, like, whoa, which at the time was amazing. Um, so that's when I was doing my first digital painting back then. So, and I think, you know, even in that kind of time, for whatever reason, I've just loved copying stuff. So like doing the logo on that piece, you know, it probably took days, but cause you know, the, the software was still pretty limited, but I would just like the idea of having a reference and kind of getting it as close as you could and translating it into this like kind of pixel form back in those days. Then uh, later on, I went on to do like a, like five years later, A-level in fine art and discovered the work of David Hockney. I'd sort of been a bit frustrated trying to paint with oils, but then I, when I found out that Hockney painted a lot in acrylics, that really was like, and they, you know, that you can use them much faster, they dry much faster. So it's harder to get any kind of um, like smudging because you've got to kind of do it straight away because it's going to dry within a couple of minutes. But I just like the immediacy of that and the, you know, the colors felt brighter. Uh, so this is the kind of thing I was painting back then then I went to Keele University, where I did a degree in visual arts and music. Um, I'll talk about the music another time, but anyway, so for my final degree show, um, I was doing this thing, which is like taking famous paintings, like if you can't tell, the Van Gogh is one on the left. <laughs> uh, and sort of doing, I, it was like the idea of like, so if you go back to Renaissance times, um, paintings and going to a gallery would have been like everyone's only way to like escape like day-to-day -day life. You know, a painting was a way of like seeing another world. And then I was thinking of like this in terms of like, then we had like PlayStation was coming out. So it was like the idea of in video games, you know, you can escape into these other worlds. So and it was also the idea of like, I took all these famous paintings, did myself as like a self portrait. So also sort of tying into art history, like artists painting themselves and stuff. Anyway, so I used to work in acrylics on these big canvases and stuff. And around, around that time, I started getting a, a Wacom tablet um, I think after I graduated, but, um, you know, that was my first like sort of digital painting. So that's why I think my stuff is still painted because my background was all kind of this. Anyway, so I graduated. It's like, oh, how am I going to make a career as an artist? Didn't really seem possible. So I actually became a web designer in instead. Um, it's just too, I mean, we, I had, a, I worked in a local company, so I live in Bedford, which is like 50 miles North. Um, so I just, we had a couple of good clients like Weetabix and Luton Airport. We, so I was just making websites and I actually really enjoyed all that world. And I was like in a full-time job for like three or four years. Then I went freelance and then I was coming into London. So I've worked all over the place, um, all different production studios, advertising agencies. Now that's a whole other thing for another day. But um, the point was by being freelance, it then freed up a bit of my time uh, to start doing more of the artwork. And over time, it's gradually kind of pushed over fully to being, um, you know, so I've been doing art full time for like six, seven years now. 
Um, so yeah, this is like a sort of timeline moment. So working in this web design studio, you know, I kind of wanted to be in London, um, but I was still kind of at home. But I basically was like, Let, let's do something. And I think a lot of, if there's anything that to take from, you know, wherever you feel like you're at and you want to be, you can always sort of take a step. And so I got involved with the kind of design community, which was a lot of it happening in London. Uh, so back in the day, we were probably too young to remember all this stuff, but like before we all had our own individual feeds, there would be these design websites that had like um, a scrolling iframe of news where like the editors would post like links to the coolest websites that were out that week and new illustrations or whatever it might be. So uh, Pixel Surgeon on the right, I really love that one because they covered movies and music. And so I kind of got involved as an editor, um, started writing about video games and I then became the music editor. That was quite fun. So this is like unpaid, but we'd get new releases. So we'd have like all these CDs come in from like Ninja Tune and um, all these different labels and stuff. We'd occasionally get to go to film premiere. So it was all good fun. Then we'd also do competitions, work with PR companies. So it's a fun way to, for me to try different like types of branding and typography and like figuring out layouts. So, you know, I enjoyed all that, that stuff. Um, and then kind of through that, that led to me doing all these magazine tutorials. So partly because like the, so the, one of the founders of Pixel Surgeon, uh, Jason Arbor, um, he's a great designer and painter and all lots of things. He was doing magazine tutorials and then I think he recommended me for someone he was literally too busy. So for like a few years I was kind of doing this kind of thing and it was like, you know, they'd want to be showing off some particular technique. So then you'd have to think of an image and then, you know, go through the steps of making it. And at that, that point, you know, no way would I consider myself an expert in the software. But the fact is, if there's a technique that you're going to, you can learn how to do it and then, you know, you can communicate to someone else. Uh, so then around this time, so this is all Pixel Surgeon connected still. You know, I loved Spaced from the moment I saw it. And I'd done this kind of fan art piece for Shaun of the Dead. And then through Pixel Surgeon, I got to interview Edgar Wright. Um, I think it was when Shaun the Dead must have been coming out on DVD. So probably like six months after the theatrical release or something like that. Anyway, so we had a nice chat. It was, you know, really nice to, to speak to. Afterwards, I sent this fan art like in an email to his agent, just said it was really nice to chat with Edgar. I just thought he might, you know, fancy seeing this. And obviously something like that, you never expect to hear back. But actually he kind of emailed me almost immediately and said he really loved it. And could he have a copy for his office? So, and I think like he still got up, that up somewhere because I saw it in a Zoom like recently about around the Sparks Brothers. So that's, you know, that was, um, again, one of those moments of like, it's just something I'd already done. And the, 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 the lucky thing was getting to speak to him for this interview, but just to have that thing already in the back pocket to, 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 to show to him. And then he was really supportive and he ended up getting it on the back inside cover of the trade paperback of the comic, which was, I didn't do the cover, but that's, you know, the IDW comic. So, and at the time, I guess that was one of my first things in print other than the magazine tutorial stuff. So, you know, another kind of like diverging timeline moment was that meant that, you know, then from that point, I was able to kind of, when I had some new artwork, I knew that I'd be able to show it to Edgar and we could, you know, you know, he'd be interested to see it. So this was probably my first like movie collage poster. And it's deliberately like really ridiculous in the sense that you know, in the same sense that the movie is like a homage slash parody of action movies. Um, the idea here was like, this should be a, a sort of homage to and parody of collage posters. So that's why I think there's like five or six Simon Peggs in there, which obviously, you know, if you look at like, say, Drew Struzan, you might have, if you think of like Blade Runner, you'll have like two Harrison Fords or two Deckards, you know, but that, that's the maximum. So I've gone a bit overboard here, but... I still, there's things I would like, you know, do totally differently now, but I do still, I quite like the kind of the atmosphere of it, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd do it better now. Um, and then I was doing things like I would do flyers for Edgar for various screenings that he was doing. Um, so like this one I did for Scott Pilgrim, that was shown at like the New Beverly in, in, in um, California. And they would have like, I think they would show this every, every month, once a month and have these midnight screenings. This ended up be seen for like a few years up there. Um, <clears throat> and then the kind of the, the timelines here, one of the screenings in London that I did a flyer for, that was seen by the people at Picture House Cinemas. 
and they were doing a they were doing like their podcast as uh, Sam Clements and Simon Renshaw, like lovely couple of people. But I started doing artwork for them, where they would be organising these sort of separate screenings of things. So it was a chance to, <coughs> excuse me, a chance to just experiment with again like working on compositions, doing different genres, working on typography and seeing how it all comes together. You know, I think we did these for like a small fee, but basically it's just, it was just, but it's just a way of building a portfolio. So that's always a good opportunity to take when you're early on in your career and it's like, you just need more work to show. Um, so we just had a load of fun with this basically. Again, some of these I still like, although, you know, if I'd go back, some of the concepts I like, the execution I might do a bit differently, but they were all fun. And then that led to, um, they were all just kind of like, I say for these screenings, then Picture House Cinemas were actually releasing a film. So they commissioned like, um, there was the official poster was like a Photoshop, like a photo sort of poster. This was like a alternative, but still official poster. But then the director really liked it and she asked for it to be the DVD cover. So that was the first chance to do something that became you know, like a physical media cover. So it was pretty cool to go into like HMV, you know, other record shops are available or, or not anymore, but you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> um, and then, you know, like to see it on iTunes, that was, and obviously, you know, it's not like you're credited on this as such, like no one can actually see who did that. There's not even a signature or anything, but you, you know, you know, you did it and it's just nice to have seen it, have an image that's out there like that. Um, and then, you know, more like timelines kind of changing. So I think through the work I'd built up through these screenings, I was then able to work with some of the galleries I'd always wanted to work with in America. So like Gallery 1988, Hero Complex, Spoke Art. I'd, I'd, I remembered I'd emailed them a few times and you know, it can be so disheartening when you just, you're just totally blanked, you know, you don't hear back. But after I built up that body of work, then they, I heard back from them finally. And they were like, yeah, I love your stuff. Like, and they invited me to lots of shows. So, I guess it's about eight or nine years ago now. Over the course of like five years, I did about 50 or 60 group shows. Um, and they were, you know, fun to do. It was nice to have, again, mostly unofficial shows, like all these, all these Wes Anderson ones, the first four were like unofficial. And then because they'd been doing these, basically Wes Anderson had seen it. So the Isle of Dogs one ended up being an official show. So again, you just don't, sometimes it's worth doing the stuff because you don't know where it's going to lead. Uh, and then just tackling different genres, different things that I liked. Again, just finding, finding your own way to work. You know, in the same sense that I love movie genres, uh, you know, within posters, there's all these different things that you can capture and, you know, or whether it's like Studio Ghibli stuff or action movies. And sometimes, you know, it's like, I just enjoyed the process of uh, what's the kind of concept for this. So like Point Break, Again, I'm doing it differently now, but just having like uh, sky, earth and water, I think worked quite well. And then the Die Hard one is more of a kind of high concept, like let's have all the characters uh, as in the, in the glass. Um, then the, the problem with something like that is once you start, you start thinking of the characters and obviously you start with the main characters and then you think, oh, well, if I have that person, I need this person. So this kind of ends up being really exhaustive. It's like the whole, it's like pretty much the whole movie. Um, but you know, you got to commit to these things once you're into it. Uh, and then all more com comedy stuff, like it's always nice to draw John Candy. So sometimes it was making more of an art print or other times, you know, adding the typography and making more of a like movie poster. Uh, and then most of these shows would be like unofficial, but sometimes they would be with the studios. So this Bob's Burgers one, like this, this went down well, which was like basically taking the actors who played the characters and then because uh, it was like, at that time, it was like, well, if I'm doing an animated series, I might like this series, but how do I make a painting of that? So this felt like a natural way for me to go. Basically take the actors, put them into the costumes and, and go for it like that. Um, and then same with Bojack Horseman. And how do I, my style feels painterly. How do I take these cell shaded things and, and make that work for me? And then I noticed like in the back of Bojack's office, he had like a cell shaded version of like the Hockney, although with a, with a horse at, at the side, 
that isn't Bojack. Uh, if you don't know the show, it won't make any sense. But anyway, this, this is a David Hockney painting that I then redid and it kind of worked perfectly for like the feel of that series. There's the original there to compare, but um, you know, so it's nice to do a parody piece basically. And sometimes those things kind of come together. So I, I often, or when, when I get an idea for a parody, I'll always go for it. Um, humor tends to, you know, people like to see, see things like this, social media, this kind of stuff tends to do better than like a sort of totally deadpan serious thing. Um, so like, you know, in Amelie where there's the old man who's trying to repaint this, um, and never getting it right. And I just thought it'd be really interesting to then take that and redo it with all the characters from Amelie in it. So stuff like that. I'm not going to insult you by showing you that this is based on the Mona Lisa, <laughs> put it next to that, but <laughs> I think you've probably seen that one, but yeah, you know, this is all fun to do. And then, you know, sometimes that comes into posters. So obviously there's loads of iconic posters that might lend themselves well. I mean, you know, and I think, I think I was asked by, by the guy organizing this poster for designer con, like to, you know, they wanted me to do a parody. So sometimes the, the stuff you like in your portfolio, you want to have stuff that, um, is in there that you wouldn't mind doing again, basically. So try and get rid of, it can be really tempting to put everything you've ever done, um, especially when you're growing your portfolio. But like if a client calls you today and they says, I want that type of thing, then you want to make sure it's something you really want. And it's like try and jettison things that don't feel like, and every six months or so, as you're making new work, you know, get rid of stuff that you wouldn't want to do if someone called you up today. But you know, I, I, I love doing all this stuff and like doing the typography and then just, stupid things like I don't really have time for this sort of thing anymore but I don't even know quite where the idea came from but just take just taking these insane you know that's a bit of a deep cut for anyone like for anyone like yeah any millennials this won't make any sense but that's kind of an iconic terrible poster <coughs> and I just I don't know that happened I did that for some reason but then it's worth it because like I think we can all agree like social media is awful and we should all spend less time on it you know, uh, but if when things like this happen, then, you know, it's worth it. Uh, and then this is probably the best known one that I've done. <laughs> to be honest, this is sort of the best idea I know I'll ever have. So <laughs> every, every piece I start after this is like, well, it's not going to be as good as that. So <laughs> I've peaked, basically. <laughs> uh, and I tried doing other ones. I was like, oh, yeah, this could work for other things. I, was, I had like a, I was doing a, a kitchen one, like with a lemon squeezer. But again, some people like cooking, so it doesn't work. And I had um, gardening, but some people like gardening. Anyway, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, then timelines, uh, like another diverging point would be, so for all those gallery shows, you know, I was like doing at one point, one every like month, month and a half. It was a nice kind of routine to be in. Um, I didn't have to be in those shows. If I'd have said, oh, I can't finish this piece, it wouldn't have ever mattered because it's just a group show. But I'd done one for like a exhibition all about bad guys. So I did the Cobra Kai and then Sony. Now that, that was like unofficial. So, you know, but then Sony got in touch with the gallery, not in a bad way, but they were working with them to release uh, various movies and they wanted to use that on the cover of the Karate Kid. And I was like, I mean, great. You know, I got paid basically to, for them to use that. I always thought it was a bit weird that it didn't have the Karate Kid on it. Because I love that movie so much. So to me, that was kind of sacrilegious, but also, okay, I'll have the, the money. So I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't care that much, but you know what I mean? But that was, that was nice. Uh, and then another thing out of those shows would be like, so I think by the time I went out, this is for like Age of Ultron, which is an official Marvel show. I'd done about 30 shows, but I'd never been, I'd always said, oh, I'll go out to America. And I never had. So for this one, I actually went. But the crazy thing was the piece that I, when I booked the flights, I'd done another piece that Marvel rejected, but my flight was booked. So I had to, I ended up doing all of these eight portraits in about, I don't know, it was like a week and a half or something. It was quite insane because I was like, I've got to have, some, I've got to be in that gallery with some of my artwork. Otherwise that's going to be just too depressing. Uh, but you know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. And these probably ended up better than the piece was. So, you know, it's fine. I'm over it. Uh, then that led to, you know, doing, this is where I started doing more like licensed prints. So the Brian Blessed one was like a private commission. Okay for time. 
And um, I was contacted by someone at, well, they're now called Fanatic, who basically had this license. Uh, and they said, would you like to license it? I checked with the people who'd commissioned it. They were like, yeah, go for it. So I changed the piece a little bit. I did Ming the Merciless to kind of match. And that was the beginning of this new phase of doing licensed prints, uh, kind of outside of the gallery group show type system. So, you know, getting to do Spielberg, obviously there's loads more Spielberg movies I'd like to do. Um, and, you know, I've always thought of myself as someone who'd want to do portraits whenever I can. Uh, but with some of the licensed stuff, you know, you're not able to basically. And I finished a whole Jaws thing with faces, submitted it. And that was the point where they were like, oh, no, you can't do the faces. Are you insane? Uh, so I had to redo it. And, you know, that's the Jaws one is obviously I probably ended up being one of my best known pieces. And again, it just goes to show sometimes out of the limitation, you know, you can get something that you weren't expecting, which can open up a whole new path for you that you didn't know you were going to be on. Um, so, but I love when you can't have the faces, I still love, what I realized is it's about, for me, it's still about observational work. Um, but in the case of like ET, it's like finding hundreds of photos of the vegetation or, you know, in the lighting of the ship and then just trying to make something that feels like it's, um, a moment, uh, from the film, but it's not a still, but it's trying to be evocative of that film. <clears throat> And then, you know, and other times you can do faces, but like for instance, doing The Godfather, I wasn't able to include Al Pacino. I mean, you know, he's there technically, but he's getting, still getting married, but you know, I couldn't do his face. Uh, and then when I did Scarface, I was able to do Al Pacino. So just different studios, different licenses, you know, you just got to go with it. I would always rather make the artwork, but it, the, it's a weird situation where like, uh, you know, I'm pleased with The Godfather piece, but if I was doing a fan art piece, I would have done a collage of everybody. Um, and then doing a licensed one, which is a great opportunity, I couldn't. So, you know, I'd say I'm glad I did it, but it's, it's, it can be a mixed blessing. Um, and then Die Hard, again, you know, wasn't able to draw, draw Bruce Willis. But I spent a lot of time, you know, trying to get his receding hair just right. <laughs> um, and this one, like some, so sometimes, you know, obviously, you know, this is a scene but then you're combining it. So I'd be like looking at the close up of where he's writing on his arm. Um, so I can do that in detail. And then you're working out from the wide, how can you crop it? So, you know, cause obviously you're taking a landscape image, you're making it vertical. <clears throat> and then, you know, in this case, I think like uh, my wife, I, I was at the bottom of the stairs doing that. My wife was photographing me and I sent the sketch over to, um, what was it, to Fox. And they rudely said, yeah, not bad, but I think it needs to be a bit more muscly. It's like, oh, un unbelievable. I'm an artist, not an action hero. Um, and then the Warriors, you know, sometimes with older movies, I think the cast had basically signed off all their, you know, they were just like, I'll do whatever you want with my likeness. So sometimes it has to go to the actors like Al Pacino, for instance, but in case of the Warriors, I think, you know, the studio could just, you know, do, do all that. So. You know, it was great. In that case, obviously, you're going to include the whole gang. <coughs> and then, um, so, you know, so sometimes you're doing a collage of different things. So this was like the Empire cover. The other one was for a, an app that was all about science fiction. So, you know, I, I love, a, I'm not going to lie, I love a vanishing point. And it, it can work well if you're doing, a, you know, a lot of a lot of characters or a lot of objects in a scene, you know, that, with a good vanishing point, you can kind of use that. So... In the case of Empire, it's like the 2001, you know, it's full of stars kind of sequence as a way to explode out from that. And then on the companion one, it's like the Stargate. And basically, you know, yeah, it's still a busy composition, but if you can, anything you can do to align to it. So whether it's characters with guns, spaceships flying out, you know, you're trying to do what you can to let the, the viewer kind of be led around it. Um, and yeah, so... I love, I love rays of light basically, and I will use them whenever I, whenever I can. <clears throat> and then sometimes, you know, the other thing that's really fun to do is when you get to do a set of things, sometimes when you're planning a series of things, you know, it's going to happen. In the case of these empire covers, they commissioned the first one and I, you know, didn't know they'd invite me back for the second one. First one was so much fun to do, like doing an old kind of uh, Western movie type poster. Um, 
obviously it was a shame that I couldn't, I didn't, wasn't able to show Grogu or he was Baby Yoda back then, of course. And then they asked me back. And then, so I had this idea of just very simple technique of just reverse the composition. So the ears the other way, um, you know, the hand is just going over that border on the other corner. And then, you know, the way that the paper is tipped is matching like the cookies on the other one. Stuff like that is always fun, like just a simple device. But, you know, again, social media is awful, trying to use it less, but, you know, something like that happens and that makes your day or, you know, your life, basically. That, that was nice. Um, and then, yeah, so this is it. Like, you know, I'm just giving away all the things I do, but I love that technique of reversing. In the case of these kind of animated Batman posters, Again, it just worked to reverse to reverse it. The, the movies are not connected. They're not. It's not a sequel or anything. But they're both. A, they're all. There's like three or four or maybe five feature length uh, movies from this series um, outside of the episodes. So I thought it'd be nice to kind of have a. Uh, you know, if I do more, I'll probably c carry this on. And but by this point, I've kind of got comfortable with the idea of like, whereas with BoJack and like Bob's Burgers. I don't know how to take these kind of like cell shaded things and make them my own. But in this case now I've, with the Batman ones, I realized like all the background art is painted. So I would just take that approach and the background art, the style of that is not a million miles away from what I do anyway. So this is just me sort of taking that style and uh, doing it to the foreground characters too. So hopefully you can still, you know, tell it's me as insofar as that's of any importance. But, you know, I love painting these even though as long as I get the, you know, the, the character, the silhouettes of the character right and the outlines, then I could just paint my normal style within them kind of thing. Uh, and then same thing has happened for like Spider-Verse and then for, for Onward, you know. And I, you know, I've always loved animated movies. So, you know, I love making these. I, I love doing portraits of live action stuff. But, you know, to get, so what, I think whatever I'm doing, it's like, what is the feel you're trying to get across? You know, with Batman, it's more more noir and more serious. And then obviously Spider-Verse is really over the top and just beautiful to look at every single frame of it. So trying to get that spirit. Onward is, I think, a really underrated movie. I really love Onward, um, both how it looks, but also the journey the characters go on and, and all that stuff. And so to get to, the, to get to make these is a real kind of dream come true, really. Um, and then I'm also... A member of another group with poster as a prefix the poster posse um and you know what's fun so i like doing the old movies and stuff but it's nice to do some marketing type things for social media normally um you know with m more recent things so when train spotting came out or muppets or even captain marvel um and then again this is another kind of timeline diverging moment basically so doing captain marvel you're working with one department at Marvel, albeit through the poster posse, but then they used the artwork in a kind of, they made a Tower Records pop-up shop where they were doing the press stuff before it came out. And our stuff was on, on vinyl and, or, you know, not really on vinyl, but on record covers and things like that in the background. Um, that then led to someone else at Marvel and then Sony commissioning me to do Spider-Man Far From Home, like steelbook cover, which is, you know, I'm probably to date, you know, the, the, I guess the biggest thing I've done, um, can't wait for the new movie. Um, and then through the, this kind of new branch that started out, I guess, not necessarily from that, but, you know, doing other Blu-rays and steel book covers, um, whether it's for new movies or old movies, you know, I, I love to do that. Like it's kind of, you know, they're, they're mini posters, I guess, but just got to hold them closer and it's like, same thing. Um, and I, you know, I grew up, um, watching a lot of uh, Kung Fu movies. I must admit, more Golden Harvest than Shaw Brothers. Um, but, you know, getting to work with Arrow on doing some artwork for, for this was really good fun. And then kind of going full circle, <coughs> Cobra Kai, that was like the first steel book I'd done. And then um, just back in the summer, they got back in touch about basically doing the whole trilogy, which is coming out in 4K. So to do a slipcase cover and... Um, like, I kind of got to that, that thing about, you know, I said they didn't have uh, Daniel or Mr. Miyagi on the cover before, so I'd always felt bad about that. So it was nice to actually go back. And this time, it's only them on the front. But this, this one, you know, it's 
yeah, it's a, it's a collage of characters and, you know, if that's, if that's not people's bag, that's, that, that's, you know, what it is, what it is. But for me, there's always got to be something in there that's a bit more than that. So in this case, it's like the reds and the yellows of Cobra Kai are kind of like oppressive on the left hand side. And then that gradually is fading away to kind of the more like Zen um, feeling of like Miyagi-Do. But it was, you know, this, this is like, I wanted to get all of the, his main opponents in there for the three films and the love interest and so on. So, you know, I do love trying to work out what the composition is and trying to use uh, like angles wherever you can to kind of hold it in place um, and think about, you know, where eye lines are going and bouncing back across each other and all that sort of stuff. So I do love, I do love planning those. Uh, and then this year I've also ended up sort of unexpectedly doing soundtrack stuff partly because, so I did this artwork in, it's for the film Sparks Brothers, which you see in there for like a split second. Um, I mean, that in itself was, was really exciting, you know, to get to do something that's in an actual film. Um, and then when the soundtrack came out, Edgar actually, again, like, he's so supportive of art and stuff. He, he got it so that the poster came with the soundtrack, uh, which was, you know, just I, I only found out about, about it the day that was happening. Um, and then that was with Waxwork Records. And then they basically really liked this. And then like literally the next day commissioned me to do these. So these are all Fear Street basically. There's all these awesome book covers from back in the day uh, by, oh, I'm gonna forget the guy's name. I've forgotten it, but you should look them up because they're great. But they're, they're, again, they're not a million miles away from what I do. They're a bit more airbrushed, but sort of realistic Realistically painted figures, albeit of like unknown people, um, with really strong light sources, like whether it's the moon or a lamp. So this is another example of doing a series, similar kind of device of like, you know, the left one is like the girl is on the on the on the right side, sorry, on the left side, and on the on the opposite, you know, she's moved across, and then in the middle, in the middle, the girl's in the middle. So just a simple way of getting them all to work as a series because it's a gatefold, it's going to open out. And then just having the, the killer, the, the, the attacker, you know, looming behind. So these were, you know, these were like really intense. I think there was only a few weeks to do all this, but it was obviously it was a great opportunity. It was like, let's, let's go for it. And then they added all of the, so all the aging effects, you know, to make them look like well, book covers, they did all that. That was actually quite nice because I like doing all that stuff. But sometimes when the deadlines are tight, you know, if you can just concentrate on the painting, let them format the logos and all that stuff. You know, I'd rather someone else is doing that. And then a more recent one. Uh, so I've also, I'm sure a lot of you have also got pieces with printed in blood in their books and uh, they're, they're nice to work on. So it's a bit of a weird one because I would sort of say generally don't necessarily advise people to do kind of spec work. Like, cause it's like you make a piece of artwork if it gets in the book, then you might be able to sell prints, but there's a chance it won't get in the book because it won't get approved. So it's a risk. Um, but like, but I'm a hypocrite because I did this, not knowing if it would be approved. So sometimes, you know, it's worth going for it. Um, again, another one where I started off thinking I'll do one or two characters. And then it's like the domino effect of like, oh, if I have them, I need to have that person. And then I'll just put everyone in. So it's pretty much got the, you know, the main cast. And then here's a few sneak peeks of stuff I've got coming up. So it's been a, you know, obviously for all of us in so many ways, it's been weird the last couple of years to say the least. Um, I've had loads and loads of stuff delayed. There's, I feel like there's hundreds of projects that I've been sitting on, but some of which are hopefully gonna come out. So yeah, I've been working on Ghostbusters and Transformers and Rocky, Batman, Wally, and some other things too, but there's a little tiny preview. And there you go. Thank you.